Hey guys, hope all is well. My name is Jamie Fenn and in today's video, we're gonna talk about all the things I wish I knew before I started using DaVinci Resolve. Now, I actually come from Final Cut Pro. I used that for a couple years and I transitioned into DaVinci. And while I was transitioning, there was a lot of things that were pretty familiar, but then there was a lot of unfamiliar territory where I had no idea what I was doing. So hopefully in today's video, you guys will be able to get your creative juices flowing. I'm not gonna be able to cover everything because DaVinci is pretty extensive, but I'm gonna go into detail on the things that I think that are the most important. And maybe some of you guys will already know this information and maybe there'll be some other things that you didn't know that was there. And by the way, I noticed that there was a ton of people who are watching my videos that are not subscribed. So make sure to subscribe if you haven't already, like this video if you like it, comment below if there's something you'd like to add. And so without further ado, let's open up DaVinci Resolve and get started. I've gotten a lot of requests asking about the difference between the light version and the studio version. This is for DaVinci 15, but I'm pretty sure it applies to 16 as well. But as you can see here, there's a ton of things that the studio version has. And so pretty much this is just kind of like a rundown. I'm just going to go through it real quick. There's a lot of things that the studio version has that, you know, you you may not need, but at the end of the day, like when you start using DaVinci a lot more, you'll pretty much use a lot of the things that you can't get with the light version. So once you open up DaVinci Resolve, the first window that pops up is this project manager and also databases. Now a database is pretty much where DaVinci stores some of its files. And what I recommend doing is starting a new database and putting it onto an external drive, preferably a solid state drive. So if you just come down here and click on new database, you can create a new one and even put a thumbnail if you want. You can choose the directory. So now over here on the right is your projects. You can see previous projects. And if you have a brand new one, it will just have an untitled project here. So what we're going to do is double click on the untitled project. And by default, this is what shows up. I took off the cut page just because I don't use the cut page. I'll explain that in a little bit. So down here on the bottom, we have our media tab, our cut tab, edit tab, fusion, color, fair light, and deliver. And essentially what you want to do whenever you start a new video is pretty much work left to right with these tabs. So starting with the media tab over here on the left, we have basically all the places that I pull videos from. If you want to add a new location, you can right click add a new location and pretty much just choose a folder where all your videos are. Another thing I suggest doing is importing your media, putting it onto an external drive, adding that drive to this location. That way you're working completely from an external drive and you're leaving a lot of the processing up to your computer instead of trying to have it pull from your computer's hard drive as well. So at this point, I'm just going to kind of walk you through the process of going through this whole program just with some simple clips. So I actually have some clips here on the desktop. I know it's not from an external, but it's just for this example. So as you can see, as I drag and dropped that folder in here, now it shows all the contents of that folder. And now we get to select which clips we want to use. And I'm just going to use all of these. So what I'm going to do is highlight all of them, click and drag them down into the media pool. It will prompt you if you want to change your frame rate. Now I'm going to show you real quick in the project settings how to change that. But right now mine's just 24. I choose do not change. And another thing I like to do for every project, I actually have a template set up, but what I would recommend doing before every project is coming down here to this little cog wheel. And that brings up your project settings. So you can have a preset for your settings if you want. These are your master settings. So you can select what timeline resolution you're in, how many frames per second your playback rate is. And what I like to do is scroll down to the optimized media and render cache and I come down to ProRes 422LT. If you're using a Windows computer, you can use DNX, R, SQ, and select uh, the SQ for both of these. And then also enable background cache after five seconds, I think is a little too long, so you can either do one or two seconds. And then as far as the rest of these settings, you can kind of choose what you want to change, but to be honest, I leave everything default. Then come down here and click Save. Great. I'm working on a MacBook, so essentially I want to make my computer work as best as possible. So if you actually highlight all the clips, I right click and I generate optimized media. 
I've already done this, so I'm just gonna rediscover optimized media. The next step you wanna do is make sure you come up to your playback. Click on, it should be default, but use optimized media if available. You can also choose proxy mode, so if you really need to go into a lower resolution, you can. And then select render cache, and I typically just put it on smart. You can put it on user, that way you can select what you want to render, but I just put it on smart. And then for fusion, I also put on just the normal default, which is on. So once you have all your clips selected and you've optimized your media, next we can move on to the edit tab. Honestly, I never use the cut tab. Unless you're cutting up a ton of footage, I really don't recommend using it. I don't wanna, you know, show some hate on the cut tab, but essentially I, I don't think there's that much of a use for it, at least with my workflow. So what I'm gonna do is come up to the workspace and turn off the cut page. So this is where we're gonna do the majority of our work for video editing. If you look up here in the top left hand corner, you have your media pool, which you have your selected clips that you dragged in, and then you have your effects library. So pretty much all the video effects and transitions and audio effects that you may want to add to your project. So what I'm gonna do is just basically highlight all the clips that I want to bring in and drag them down into our timeline. This will automatically create a timeline of our clips. And I do have a few things over here that are selected like the mixer, the audio mixer, which sometimes I just kind of turn off for the major part of the editing process. And then we have the metadata tab, which shows you each clip's you know, details pretty much. And then we have the inspector. So the inspector is actually something that you can do some like custom uh, you know, just parameters with the individual clip that you have selected. So I'm just actually gonna delete all the audio just because I don't need audio playing for this example. Back to the inspector, we have basically everything that we need to do some major corrections for the clip. So everything from the way it layers, the transform. So if you wanna change the size or rotate it, you can use these parameters here. And if these don't show up, you can actually just double click on the actual one that you want and hide it, show it. Next is cropping, it's pretty self-explanatory, just kind of crops what you want to crop. Next is the dynamic zoom, so say if you have a tripod shot and you want to do some dynamic zoom on it, you can actually just turn this on and it will create a zoom effect essentially really quickly. And you can choose whether it eases in or out or both, and then you can also swap it so it could, could do the reverse. So it could just, you know, from a zoom in to a zoom out. And also, if you want to turn the effects on or off, you can just select these tabs here. Next, we have stabilization. Now, for every clip, it's going to be different. So perspective, similarity, and translation are the three options that we have here. You can adjust pretty much the, the way the parameters work of the tracking feature by just dragging these sliders up and down and choosing the strength. Sometimes you'll get a weird warping effect for certain clips, so you may have to adjust these parameters and select different options here to get the best results. Next, we have retime and scaling. Now, this is uh, kind of, I did actually a tutorial on how to do some slow motion stuff. So I show you how to use optical flow. I'm pretty sure that's only in the paid studio version. And I also teach you how to use the speed warp. Um, this is pretty much just kind of for blending the clip frames together. So for example, if you have a clip that's 24 frames a second and you wanna slow it down, or 60 frames or you know if something just looks kind of choppy you can adjust these and make it look a little bit smoother next we have lens correction now this basically analyzes the clip and so say if you have a gopro shot like this here it will pretty much um kind of distort it so if you look at the if you look at the video you can kind of see how it's warping the actual video and so if you have a really fish-eyed looking camera shot you can adjust this or you can just click on analyze and it will do its best to analyze the clip and adjust it appropriately. Okay, so now we have this range of tools here. Now each one of these does something different. I'm gonna hide the inspector tab, so I'm gonna click on the inspector. And so basically the tools that I use the most here is this zoom feature, which you can drag back and forth, or you can hold down alt or option and scroll up and down on your mouse wheel to do the same thing. You can also adjust how your video looks as far as track height and also audio view options. We don't have any audio, unfortunately, I just deleted it, but you can choose different options on how everything kind of looks. So you can minimize things, you can make them look bigger, you can make them look smaller. 
and pretty much you can adjust it to the way you like it. So I typically only use the blade tool to cut clips. So if I want to, I can just come over here and I'll select B and that'll make the blade tool show up on my, my cursor. And I'll just clip where I want the clip and then I'll push A to go back to the arrow and delete that clip by just pushing delete or backspace. I actually made a tutorial on all my favorite shortcuts and what each of these tools actually do. So check it out above now. This is a very important tool. This is a, uh, if you push N, it'll kind of snap to grid. So say if you want to turn this on, which you see it's a little illuminated, you can drag and clips will kind of snap to each other. You see how it snaps. If you turn that off by pushing N, it gives you a little bit more of a finer feeling and it doesn't necessarily lock it on. So if you're trying to match up music or, you know, really fine tune clips, you can do that. And then say, if you just want to roughly go quickly, you can turn it back on pushing N and it'll snap to those points of other clips. Okay, so just real quick with the transitions and stuff, you can pretty much just drag and drop. You have to make sure that the clips have enough transition time. So you have to kind of go in on each one of these clips and you can drag and drop and then you can adjust how far the transition works. Ooh, cute puppy. Look at that. Um, so as far as the effects and stuff, you guys will just have to play with these. It's pretty similar to other video editing programs. You can just drag and drop in the text. And so for example, if I bring in a title here, I go back up to the inspector for this clip and it will have the parameters for this specific title clip. So if I wanna type in something like, I don't know, Jamie Fenn, super original. Uh, you can basically kind of adjust the parameters here. You can adjust everything with the fonts and the spacing. You can change the font if you want. You can, you know, choose if you want bold, any type of different, you know, font that you have installed on your computer. Pretty much almost every font that I've downloaded will register in DaVinci. Some, some don't. And then, yeah, so you have other titles here, which are a little bit more 3D like. So if I, you know, put in something like this, you have more of like a, you know, it's more 3D. It's not just a, a text. So, so I'm going to do a couple examples of some keyframing real quick. If we actually come up to the transform, and say we want to maybe do a parallax effect. What you can do is come over here and each one of these little dots next to each one of these parameters is a keyframe button. So we can start with something like zoomed in like that, click on that keyframe button. And then when it gets to this point, you can drag it back to the one, which is default. So now when we have a clip here, it's zooming out the whole time. I wouldn't necessarily do that for that clip, but that's just an example. And so say if you want to adjust the parameters, because when you do a keyframing like that, it's very linear, meaning it's just point, change, point, change. So in order to actually change the way that parameter is working, you can come down to the clip. And I'm gonna change the size of our video by dragging this up and you can actually come down here to the right of this clip right here, see that little squiggly line? You can click on it. And what that does is it brings up our keyframe parameters for this clip. So if you want to adjust the zoom, you can drag this up and back and forth according to where you want it to happen in the clip. But like I said, it's linear. So how do you change it so it's a little bit more curved? Well, if you actually click on this clip, you can click on this button right here or pretty much any of these. It depends on the actual parameter. Some of them work differently but you can choose to kind of play around with the curve of this and adjust it to your liking. So if you want it to be really quick, you know, you can do something like that. You can also move it. So, it, you know, you can just play around with exactly what you're trying to do for your clip. It's really nice. So say if you want to come over here and maybe just add another keyframe for some reason, you can actually come here and this keyframe button will add a keyframe to this parameter. So we're working with, you know, the zoom. So if you want, you can play with that. And again, it's very linear. So you can click on that keyframe and adjust it like that. Just drag out that, maybe make this a little bit bigger so you can see what we're doing. And I don't know, just mess around with it and just do some weird things. And that's how you keyframe. 
So let's get rid of this keyframing. And how I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna come back up here to the zoom where we were doing all the keyframing because we weren't doing anything on anything else. We're gonna click on this refresh arrow and that will get rid of all the keyframing. So the next thing I'm gonna cover is some uh, retiming. So essentially like how to speed ramp or how to slow down a clip. So there's a couple ways you can do it. So I'm actually gonna right click on the clip and bring up retime controls. And this shows basically these little arrows here showing you what is what. So right now the blue arrows represent 100%. So say if I want to speed ramp to this point, I can actually just move the playhead to that point, click on this down arrow and add a speed point. And now essentially we can make changes to this clip right here. So you can adjust it so the speed is faster or slower. Here, I'll make this a little bit bigger. So again, when it's blue, it's in the positive, and when it gets to yellow, that means it's slowing down. And you can drag that, that playhead around like this and adjust it to your liking. So say if you wanna do something really fast, you could go into it like that. But again, it's very linear. You can also adjust by clicking on the bottom. You can adjust how far the speed ramp happens. So you can choose the speed of how quickly it moves by selecting the upper one. And you can also drag the bottom to change the point of where the speed ramp occurs. Just like we adjusted the keyframes, we're going to now adjust the speed ramp or the change of speed by right clicking and going to retime curve. And now this brings up basically our retime curve. And this is the speed ramp up to this point. You can see where we created a new change in time with the speed. And if we click on this, you can actually click on that. You can click on this parameter here and you can adjust if it eases in or out. So if you want it to be really fast and also when you drag this around, you can see that it changes the speed of the other clip on the right hand side. So if you want it to be, you know, normal speed, just match that up to be roughly, you know, hundred. And if it's not perfect, you can actually click on this down arrow and adjust and reset to hundred. So now we have the speed ramp into him doing a sweet ass wheelie. If you want to retime something else, perhaps you can click on this down arrow on the left and there's all these other parameters that you can change. If you do do a keyframe over here on the right, you will want to select that specific parameter. It will bring up the line. And for example, I haven't really done anything, but you can you know, select the position X. I don't know, I just selected it. Come over here to the keyframe button and then maybe come back here, select another keyframe, and then you can change the parameters of that specific setting. So, you know, maybe you wanna center a shot a little bit better. Okay, so and I think I've done quite a bit in the edit tab, but like I said, this is where you're gonna do the majority of your work. There is a ton of things you can do. But next, let's move into Fusion. It is complicated. I'm not going to sugarcoat this for you. It was so weird coming into and having no idea what I was doing. I literally spent like two weeks just like dinking around trying to figure out what I was doing. But at the end of the day, it definitely gets really simple. Uh, you just have to kind of understand the way nodes work. And I think a lot of people are used to layers and people don't can't. It's hard for people to kind of grasp the concept of what a node is tree kind of does and when i say no tree i mean that's basically if you were taking layers and combining them but nodes is just kind of like a different way of working with layers so i'm just going to make a simple composite of something so i have a clip here that by the way if you're in the edit tab you have to make sure that the playhead is over the clip that you want to do fusion effects on if it's over here it will do fusion effects on that clip if it's on this clip, it will do fusion effects on this clip. You can also right click on the clip and create a new fusion clip and it will make a dedicated clip for fusion. Either way works though. So I'm gonna come into fusion again. We're gonna do a simple composite of just some text. So pretty much we have one clip here. If you wanna make a fusion composition with a couple layers, you can highlight all of them, right click, new fusion clip and then go into Fusion and it will actually have Median 1, Median 2, Median 3. I have a bunch of examples of different types of visual effects tutorials that I'll link above right now. And 
you guys can check them out. I kind of walk you through a, a, a lot of things actually. And uh, there's a lot of shortcuts I'll show you. We have a median in and out point and everything we want to do is pretty much going to happen in between these points. It's the clip essentially. And we're just going to kind of add layers and we're going to kind of make like a, a sandwich of things inside to make uh, some effects. And the most common node that's used for adding things to a clip is a merge node. Now you have a selection of tools here that you can select from, or there's a shortcut that I always use, which is holding down shift and pushing spacebar. This brings up all your tools. So if you know exactly what you want real quick without navigating through all your effects over here on the left, you can type in merge and there's different types of merge nodes. There's merge for 3D environments and there's merge nodes for basically just a 2D environment. So we're just gonna use the normal merge node. And so it, by the way, if you look over here on the left, you have all these other tools that you can use. You should navigate through these. You should click on each one, drag it in, look at it. It's very important to kind of just get the idea of how things work together so we have a merge node here. And what we'd have as a merge node here is different inputs. And these inputs represent a foreground and a background and an alpha channel. And then we have our output here. So if you actually hold down shift and drag the merge node down on top, now we have this clip that we have selected here connected to the background. Essentially, now anything that we do and add to this merge node specifically, this is the foreground, meaning it's going to be on top. If I connected this node here to this green arrow, that means it'll just be flipped. And we don't want to do that because what we want to do is add things on top of this clip. So the next thing we can do is click on text. And again, it's kind of similar to the edit tab. We have our inspector, metadata, keyframing, and spline, which is kind of works hand in hand with our keyframing. So I'm gonna turn those off and only turn on the inspector. And I'll type in Utah. And so you can see there's nothing happening because we haven't connected these nodes together. The only thing that is happening is we are viewing our median out. And just FYI, I should have mentioned this in the very beginning of this whole fusion lesson, is that if you select one or two on your keyboard with a specific node selected, you can choose to see what you're doing on that node. And these windows here are working hand in hand. So if you want to have text in viewer window number one, I pushed one and there it is. So now anything you do will happen in that window with one selected. So I typically like to have a node that I'm working on in viewer window number one. And then what I like to do is have my final composition on media out, which is pretty much all the work I'm going to do in combining it with the final result. So now since I have my text, I can drag it in and it's going to be merged on top of this clip. And so essentially what you can do is now say you have, you know, you have your text here but you want to add another layer on top of this clip. Okay, so next we can just select, you know, click out here, or you can click on this merge node, hold down shift, type in merge again, hold down shift, push spacebar, type in merge again. It automatically links these nodes together. So now we can add something else. Add another text, for example. And this one can be Moab. And what's great is if it's layered on top, you can just click on these arrows here and just move it down. If you want to apply the same keyframing technique like I showed you in the edit tab here in the fusion window, you totally can do the exact same process. And this is like kind of like a basic walkthrough. Like I said, I've got tutorials. I'll be linking them up above if you guys want to check out more advanced things. But I'm just trying to show you kind of like the basic workflow. The next thing I want to do is come over to the color tab. I'm just going to delete all the text stuff. Now, this is a major reason why I actually started using DaVinci is because the flexibility and all the parameters and all the accuracy, like just everything in this tab is awesome. Everything in every tab is awesome. So over here on the right, we have kind of the same as Fusion nodes. And if you hold down Alt S, you can create a new node or you can right click here add corrector parallel you can add 
different types of nodes, but the most basic and used one, I think, is just the simple color corrector node. So essentially what this does is it creates a layer, and anything you do on this layer will affect the clip. Down here on the left, we have different types of parameters, and the most used one is the color wheels. Um, I'm not going to show you camera raw because that's for more advanced. The color matcher is something, I actually did a tutorial on this, so if you guys want to check it out, link's above right now. Next, we have color wheels, where we have three options, and it's basically primary wheels, primary bars, which is actually a little bit easier to use when you're only having a mouse and keyboard. Sometimes it's nice to, you know, just have specific colors to push and pull towards. And we have our log wheels, which is more of like a fine tuning uh, aspect of getting some color into places where you like them. And so down here, we have our white balance picker. We have our auto button, which basically just auto corrects. DaVinci just kind of auto corrects what it thinks it needs. And then we have these parameters here at the bottom, which are contrast. So you can crank contrast. You have your pivot, your low range, your high range, your saturation, and your hue. Now, the main things I use for this number one tab, which are these parameters here, is I pretty much use the contrast to pump a little bit of contrast. You can also do it a different way, I'll show you. And also using the saturation. Then you have number two, where you can change your temperature, hotter or colder. You can change your tint to green or purple. You have your mid-tone detail here, which is kind of like clarity if you ever use uh, Lightroom. I kind of I kind of think it's similar to clarity in my opinion. And then you have color boost, which is kind of like vibrance in Lightroom. And then you can raise your shadows or highlights by using these parameters. It's very similar to using Lightroom in my opinion. These tabs I'm not going to really cover just because I don't think uh, some of these features are available in the light version, but this is where you would do some noise reduction and you can choose different parameters. I'll probably do a tutorial in the future on the fine tuning and details of all these parameters here. Next we have these settings here, which you can adjust and they work kind of like the color wheels and the primary wheels and the log wheels over here, but you're using curves. And in order to kind of use these appropriately, you want to come over here to the right and turn on your scopes, which is this icon here. And then you can click on your waveform or whatever you have default open and select which one you want to look at. If you don't know what scopes are, just do a quick Google search and kind of just give yourself a, a rundown on how to use these and what they do. You can actually click on the big arrow and then select these options up here in the top right hand corner and select kind of just what you want to look at. So everything here is on the first node so far that I've been doing. So I'm just going to right click on it, reset node. I'm going to grade this clip real quick with you guys. It's going to be quick. It's not going to be exactly what I would do on every clip, but it's just kind of getting a basic grade. So for basic grading, you can pretty much use the primary wheels here, or you can use the curves. I like using the curves. So I'm going to pull down these shadows here and I'm looking at my waveform. If you actually turn down the saturation too, you can see a little bit better accurate waveform. And then I'm going to bring up the waveform and zero being the darkest, 1023 being the brightest, meaning like almost nothing, no, no information. I want to bring that up to about right there. I don't want to go too far with it. And then also, if you want to add some contrast, you can add a simple S curve like that. Then I'm going to bring the saturation back up and that kind of gives me a good balanced clip as far as my shadows and highlights. The next thing we can do is actually come over here to our node chart and hold down alt option and select another node. So now that we have our black and white points set, we can add some contrast. We can add some saturation. So I'm going to come back down here, turn up the saturation. And if you look at your vector scope, you can see if you're pushing things too far. Vector scope is good for saturation and seeing where your colors are kind of headed and this is just like basic grading i mean you don't have to like you know everything is going to be different if you want to apply a lut you can basically hold down alt option create a new node right click on it go to luts 3d lut and there's one from ground control he has a bunch of awesome free stuff on his website you should check it out his name's casey ferris there's a vlog to rec 709 lut kind of looks almost what I was 
doing by just individual nodes. You can do either way. Um, LUTs are something you should look more into. So there's different kinds of LUTs out there. There's like the kind that transforms your vlog footage or whatever profile that you shot in to the Rec 709 color space. And then there's types of LUTs that are on the more creative side, which you would put maybe at the end or almost at the end of your node tree. The one I just put on is a vlog to Rec 709. I can make further adjustments from here by just adding more nodes. And as I add more nodes, this basically just works as a node tree. So anything I do on future nodes will affect the node down underneath. And so basically you can, you know, play around with all these features here. You can select different clips and color them. I'm just trying to go over this really quickly. Also, if you want, you can adjust uh, these individual red, green, and blue curves. So if you want to adjust and pull some blue out of the highlights and push blue into the shadows or, you know, do the same thing. You can just kind of adjust what you want to do with these curves. You can kind of make your own LUTs and your own looks, kind of play around with those. So next on the curves selection, you can actually go over to these little dots and over here, you'll see what the selection is. So in this case, these are the hues and you can click on this drop down menu and select what you'd like. You can click on each one of these individual colors and kind of look over here at your waveform or a specific color. If you look at your vector scope as well, it's easier to kind of look at the specific color. So like, you know, for this shot specifically, there's definitely some blues and some cyan that is pretty saturated. And so if you want to maybe adjust the hues or the saturation, you can click on these dots here. And it's kind of nice to be able to just click on each one of these and kind of mess around. And as you look at the vector scope, you can see what colors are being pushed. So this is saturation. So this is how saturated each color is. If you want to change the hue, you can come back over here to the hue versus hue and you can, you know, make certain hues of each color kind of change a little bit as you see in the example up here. This is also luminance. So for example, if you don't want to click on each one of these, you can click on the line itself and adjust a specific point that you want to change in color for the specific selection. And say if you want to select a specific color in this shot, you can actually click on this little selection here and come up here to the scene and pick the color that you want to select. So for example, click on the green and it creates a point where that specific color range is. And now you can play with that green. So you can adjust the luminance with this, for example. You can come over here to the hue versus hue and select a specific point like that. It'll create another point, as you can see here, and you can adjust the hues of this. So you can kind of just play around with it. And then also you have luminance and saturation. You know, this is on the luminance. So if you want to desaturate the, the shadows, you can pull it down here. Um, so create a point here and just kind of pull this down. You can desaturate shadows like that. Same thing with the highlights. So next is the qualifier tool. You can select a range of a color that you like and play with that specific color. I actually just put out a tutorial on using this for getting really good skin tones. There's a great example of how to use the qualifier tool. So definitely check that out. Link is above. Next are power windows. So you can select a window and pretty much grade or do whatever you want within this window or outside of this window. So if you want to do like a, uh, a vignetting, you can turn your shadows down over here or you can go to your shadows here and bring them up. If you hold down shift and push H, you can see what the power window is doing and then you can push that again and turn it off to see what it looks like on the clip that you're editing. You can create your own power windows, shape them out. You can do your own gradients. I'm not gonna cover the tracker in the color tab just because I feel like I can make another tutorial on that specifically, so. Then there's sharpening, which I think is only in the studio version. Then you have your key outputs and inputs and the qualifier. You can adjust how strong the node that you did your adjustments on is working with the nodes below it or above it. And also say if you have some adjustments here and you want to make some color changes or some adjustments over the whole video, you can actually come up here to the, the second little dot and do some adjustments over the whole clip by just 
adding a node and whatever you do will now affect all the videos underneath. So say you want to add some effects to a clip, you can click on a node and come up to open effects and pretty much just kind of add in whatever you want from this open effects options. There's a bunch of stuff there that's with the studio version and there's also some things that the free version has. Next real quick is the audio tab. So I'm actually not going to cover too much here just because I did actually a tutorial on how to kind of balance audio and your vocals. I'll link that up above. It kind of teaches you the basics of how to kind of create a good sounding overall mix uh, and just kind of get your levels right and how to kind of safeguard your your master output so you don't clip. You can adjust the volume of the mixer here and you can also add different effects. But like I said, I made a tutorial on it. So check out that video and it'll kind of give you guys a good run through. Okay, so finally the deliver tab. Now everybody kind of asks, hey, what's your settings? What do you do? What and to be honest, I kind of just go with these settings here. So I choose the file, I browse for the folder. I do a single clip, I export a QuickTime video. I just choose H.264 because a lot of my videos are just for YouTube or my Instagram. You can also change your resolution here, but if you change your resolution here, for example, to 4K, you have to go back to your project settings and go up to your master settings and change your timeline resolution to the 4K settings. Your project will not export in 4K. It'll tell you, you need to change your, you know, your master settings. Also, I don't know if you can export in 4K with the free version. I think it said that you cannot, but just double check that list that I showed you in the very beginning. The next thing I like to do is I used to always put automatic and I actually kind of restrict to 80,000. I see some people putting 40, 30, maybe 80,000 is overkill and maybe automatic is not the best, but I get pretty decent results with this. And then everything else here, I kind of just leave default. I don't really mess with any of this just because I don't, I haven't needed to and everything looks pretty good. So once you've selected that, you can click add to render queue. Since I haven't picked a space for this video, it's asking me where I should save it. It'll show up here in the render queue and then make sure you come down here and you either have your in and out range, which you can select by dragging the playhead and pushing I and then coming to the end or some random place and pushing O if you want a specific in and out range of your timeline. If you want the whole timeline, then select entire timeline. Then when you come up here, click start render, it will render to that spot and you should be good to go. Now, I know there's probably so many things that I've missed, but there are tutorials I've linked above during this video. And if you guys watch those videos, I hope that it will kind of take your creativity to the next step or the next level. Um, if there's anything I missed or if I should make like a, you know, version 2.0, comment down below and let me know because then I'll just make another video and kind of go over all the things that I didn't cover here. So that'd be awesome, you guys. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Just to turn up the noise in my head I told you that one day ain't